Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. The King James text today reads, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you? that ye should not obey the truth. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Verse 9 declares, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If you bow your heads with me one more time quickly today, Master, once again, God, we come before you because the moment in our service has come when the Word of God must go forth, and if this is not a divine operation, if it is not a divine function, then it is a worthless exercise. We need, as people of God today, to hear from heaven. We need today, Lord, a word that comes from the throne of grace, we don't need man-made doctrine. We don't need dogma. We need truth that is disseminated by the Holy Ghost by reason of illuminating the Word of God. Master, touch the speaker. Help me, God, to faithfully deliver the Word that you have laid upon my heart for the church of the living God at this moment. And Lord, touch the ear of every hearer, every individual. Not only those listening right at this moment live, but those who will later, the hundreds who will later watch this message by reason of our many video ministries online. Master, today bring us truth that is able to liberate and set us free, not doctrine and religion that is able to bind. Master, in the name of Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. You know, there's an old song that I love to hear sung, and I love to sing it when I'm of a voice, and I'm able to sing it. And that old song says, little is much when God is in it. Amen. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful thing to know sometimes that even when we are doing what appears to be very little, that God is able to turn that little into a great deal. Amen. Amen. He's able to take the efforts of this little church in Dallas, Texas, and he's able to touch it miraculously as he touched the bread and the fishes and was able to feed multitudes that day. And he's able to use this little church in Dallas to reach out and touch hundreds and even thousands of souls around the world. And we're grateful to God for those, uh, for that miraculous ability he has to turn little into much.
But today I would put to you the truth that there are times when a little is too much. The Apostle Paul in our primary text today was writing to the church at Galatia and explaining to them that it doesn't take a whole lot of compromise or a whole lot of bad doctrine to pollute the entire uh, system and to pollute the entire faith. A lot of people think that to go off the rails, you know, you've got to go way off the rails. You've got to go way off in the wrong direction. But the truth is that if you were to take a train track that normally runs straight in this direction, and you were to turn that track one inch off at an angle just one inch to the right or one inch to the left from the straight direction it normally goes in, the further you travel, the further you'll be from where you ought to be. Am I telling the truth? Right. Because that little change in angle back here affects your destination. Right. A lot of your cults that exist in the world today, a lot of pseudo-Christian, a lot of religious cults that exist today, exist because one little falsehood, one little untruth crept into their doctrine. And next thing you know, their track was redirected ever so slightly. It didn't look like a whole lot to begin with. But all they needed was that slight misdirection. And before too long, as time went by and as their doctrine developed, all of a sudden they were way off of left field somewhere. That's why it's imperative that we be careful of the doctrine that we preach. That's why as an apostolic church, our test and our measure is, is that which we preach true and faithful to the doctrine and the teaching and the practices of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ? As they alone were given the authority by the Lord Himself to establish doctrine and truth for the church. Paul said, some of you all have gotten set off track. Some Jewish believer has come and convinced you that even though you're born again according to the message of the gospel, you still need to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. You still need to go through this procedure if you're ultimately going to make heaven. People love to add conditions to God's gospel. I'm going to yeah. tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ is too stinking easy. It is too stinking simple. He said, believe, he that believeth on me, though he were dead, hallelujah, yet shall he live. It's too easy. And men love to come in and complicate it. Yes. All of a sudden, in order to be saved, you've got to go and take your first communion. And you've got to go and be confirmed. And you've got to go and confess your sins to the priest. Or you've got to follow this set of laws and this set of mandates and this set of rules. You can't dip snuff. You can't smoke cigarettes. You can't touch your lips to alcohol. You can't wear this kind of clothing. You can't put scissors in your hair. Next thing you know, man has complicated the gospel to such a horrendous degree. And we're convinced by preachers and by denominations and organizations that heaven and eternity in the presence of God is contingent upon so many things that we do and in fact that we are able to do. For LGBT believers, we're told that to make heaven, 
We've got to change our orientation. You cannot be who you are. You cannot feel what you feel. You cannot simply be true to yourself. You've got to live a life of misery. You've got to live a life of depression. You've got to live a suicidal existence every day of your life fighting against your natural inclinations. Because after all, somebody tells us unless a gay man or a lesbian woman is able to make themselves straight, they have no hope of heaven. Well, I'm here to tell you today, the blood of Jesus that I preach is far more powerful than that. Amen. Amen. And if you can make heaven being a liar, and you can make heaven cheating people in business, if you can make heaven being divorced and remarried three, six, eight times, if you can make heaven uh, not being able to live in victory, if you can make heaven being ugly and mean and spiteful, and you say, well, brother, I don't believe you can make heaven to be those things either. You better hope you can make heaven and be those things. Because, honey, I got news for you. If you're not at least two or three of them, you're one of them. That's right. Word of God said if we say that we have no sin, we're calling God a liar and the truth is not in us. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is Jesus Christ came, listen to me, to save us from the effects of and the penalty of sin. But that does not mean that He came so that you would no longer sin. Right. Never happen. As long as you're in a human body, that'll never happen. Sin will ever be present in your life. There are going to be things you do that fail God. There are going to be things you do that disappoint the Lord. And the only hope we have of standing before God in righteousness and truth is what the Apostle Paul said in our primary text today, Ephesians 5 and verse number 8, I think. Excuse me, no, I read it wrong. Verse number 5. For we through the Spirit wait... When you're waiting for something, that means it has not yet arrived. We wait for what? For the hope of righteousness by faith. So every day that we await the Lord's return, every day that we await our passing from this life and closing our eyes, on this side of the veil and opening them up in heaven. Every day that we wait, we are waiting in hope. What are we hoping for? Righteousness. Hallelujah. But we're waiting for it. And what are we waiting for it with? Are we just waiting for it with blind hope? No. By faith. Hallelujah. So we put our trust and our confidence in what Jesus did, in who Jesus is, in what Jesus said, in what Jesus was able to do. Hallelujah. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with me. All I've got to do is maintain my faith in Him. I want to tell you, you better be careful, Paul said. You guys have allowed someone to creep in and convince you that there is one little issue, just one little thing you need to add to the gospel. He said, oh, but let me tell you a little secret. When you start dipping into the law of Moses, you're playing on very dangerous ground. Let me tell you something, Christian. Those of you today who love to quote the law of Moses, to other believers. Well, the Bible said man shall not lie with a man as with a woman. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, the minute that you claim the law and the keeping of the law is essential and necessary to man's salvation, the Apostle Paul said in our primary text today, you become obligated to keeping the entirety of the law. 
You see, grace and law, faith and law cannot live in the same room. They cannot occupy the same throne. Those two concepts and those two doctrines are at conflict with one another. You can't have law and grace. So Paul said, the moment you begin to embrace any single point of the law, as essential to salvation. Listen to this. We read it in our primary text. Paul said, ye have fallen from grace. Well, I'll tell you, people love, well, these people I grew up in church with, grandma and her crowd, the Assemblies of God crowd, they love to talk about folks falling from grace. They love to sit around and try to figure out who it is this week that has fallen out of God's favor and no longer is on the roll for the rapture, is no longer on God's uh, roll in the Lamb's Book of Life because of something they said or something they did or some attitude they had this week. Everybody loves to try to figure out, what do you have to do to fall from grace? Well, if you do this, bless God, then you have forfeited your salvation. Well, let me tell you what Paul said. Paul said, if you begin to believe for one moment that the keeping of even one point of the law is going to affect your salvation. He said at that moment, you have fallen from grace. You know, it's funny because growing up as a kid, I heard a lot of people talk about a lot of folk in the church falling from grace, but not one time did anyone ever cite the reason as being their belief that the keeping of a singular point of the law was essential to salvation. Tommy, not one time did I ever hear that reason given. Today, we as the human race are facing one of the most dangerous and deadly viral outbreaks ever known to man. The news is dominated by experts and commentators who seek to enlighten their viewers and listeners to the dangers and the necessary disciplines if one is to avoid becoming infected by the coronavirus. Without embracing the rules of conduct that we are, that have been expounded to us by scientists and doctors and medical professionals, which, by the way, may well contradict our natural inclinations and habits. We are told that we expose ourselves to a virus which is able to sicken many and even kill many. I told Tommy the other day, I said, you know, the thing about a virus that gets me, those little buggers are so small you can't even see it. Man, if it was at least the size of a tick, if it were at least the size of a deer tick and you can identify it visually and it didn't take special equipment and it didn't take uh, a special microscope in order to see it, if you could at least visually identify it, be a whole lot easier to avoid, be a whole lot easier to know who potentially has been infected, it'd be a whole lot easier to uh, keep the thing under tabs. But no, we're dealing with a very small, very tiny viral infection. And sometimes even a little is too much. Even the smallest thing is able to infect. Look at the size of our human body. Even a child is millions of times bigger than that little virus, and yet that little virus is able to cause us so much grief, to bring upon us sickness. And for those who are already dealing with health issues, it potentially can even take their lives. Then we've got scientists and doctors telling us that there are things we must do. We must socially 
separate ourselves. We've got to keep ourselves at a distance from others. We can't shake hands like we normally would. Now that's customary, that is something we do, uh, within American custom anyway, the Japanese and Chinese and all, they bow, so they're kind of in good shape, as long as they stay so many feet apart from one another, but in America we shake hands, if you're a friendly person, like I am, I, I love to bless children, when I'm in a, a, a supermarket or when I'm in a restaurant, I had a, I had a habit, you know, where I would just pat a child on the head, and mom and dad didn't know this, but as I'm doing that, I'm saying, God bless this child. Keep them safe, Jesus. Protect them, Lord, of molestation or any kind of evildoer. See, I'm blessing that kid, but mom and dad don't know that's what I'm doing, but that's literally what I'm doing. Now, say, Pastor, you don't pray that big, long prayer the whole time. You be standing there patting the kid for 10 minutes. No, God knows I've got that prayer up in heaven stocked up, and when I lay hands on a child, I say, okay, Lord, remember that prayer? That's the one I'm applying to this one. Well, I can't do that anymore. I love babies, so I love me some babies. Tommy goes nuts because I'm walking through a, a restaurant and he's talking to me and let there be a baby within eyesight. And immediately, like a magnet, I stop and I start talking to the baby and admiring the baby and telling mom and dad how pretty their baby is. And there's Tommy still walking, still talking. Only problem is I'm not there anymore because I done stopped. And then when I finally get to the table, he'll look at me and say, You do that to me all the time. That drives me crazy. But I love me some babies. Well, now I am much more conscious of doing that. I make sure I keep a distance. You know, I don't want the parents to be uncomfortable. I don't want anybody to feel like I'm up, you know, on top. I mean, I don't jump on the kid to begin with. But, you know, I just keep a distance and, and try to keep it. Uh, as the scientists and the doctors recommend. The other day I was out mowing the lawn on my garden tractor. <clears throat> the neighbor next door come over. He's a friendly fella. And, uh, he and I get along well. And he come over to talk to me for a minute and immediately without thinking about it, without a thought in my mind, I reached out to shake his hand and I shook his hand. And then afterwards I thought, oh Lord, the doctors, the scientists on television say we shouldn't be doing that right now. And and look at me as I'm speaking. I'm touching all over my face. Oh, the doctors say you shouldn't be doing that right now. Well, there's a lot of things they're telling us, Tommy, that if we're going to avoid this little tiny infection, this little tiny virus, there are a lot of things we have to do. And it's a matter of discipline. You've got to discipline yourselves to do these things that they recommend you do or do not do. I've never been one to wash my hands every 30 seconds, you know. I never felt the need to do so. I'll be honest with you, when I was a kid, I could be making mud pies. Mom could come out with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and I wouldn't think that now some of y'all are gagging and choking and say, oh, that's disgusting. My mother would send me in the house and tell me to wash my hands first. Well, I honestly, and I never thought about it. I never cared about it. It wasn't the biggest thing in, in my mind. But of course now I'm much more conscious of it and now I'm washing my hands far more often than I used to. And I'm doing it far more thorough than I might have done it in the past. Why? Because these scientists and these experts and these doctors and these health professionals are telling us that this is what we must do if we're not only to keep ourselves from harm, but if we're to keep our neighbor from harm. And certainly, uh, I don't want to be an instrument of infection for someone else either. But you've got to learn now all these disciplines, all these new behaviors, all these new actions, all these new ways of doing things that may not have been the way you've always done things, but now suddenly to prevent infecting yourself or infecting someone else, you've got to learn all these new disciplines. 
want to tell you today, we live at a time when discipline is absent. And people have chosen to live without rules, guidelines, or any limitations. Now, I'm an affirming, I'm an LGBT affirming pastor, and I'm going to say some things today, sure as shooting, they're going to get me in trouble with some of my hyper-liberal friends. I say hyper-liberal because I believe liberally as a rule. However, I think liberal thinking can also go to the point of being stupid. I believe that it is possible. I think there's a lot of conservative folks in America who are sick and tired of a lot of liberal folks in America because they're tired of the hyper-liberalism. When you get so liberal and so absurd and so idiotic in your beliefs and in your thinking that it, it just doesn't even stand up to reason anymore. And I've got news for you folks. There are people like that drives me up the wall. I've had people write me on Facebook and try to chew me out because I still use the acronym LG, uh, uh, LGBT for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. Well, don't you know that now we include SPCTPQRLMNO? I don't care. Oh, watch. Somebody's going to write me. Well, you should care. We've added these other letters in order to include other people. Listen. Listen. The way I understand it, the way I look at it, when we say, say LGBT, that is inclusive. That, that is not specifying any particular people. That to me, those letters represent castaways and castouts and people who are of an orientation and a natural inclination that doesn't fall into the majority. So anything that falls into that category, so far as I'm concerned, falls under the LGBT heading, okay? I don't need to add 35 more letters to it and spell out supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. But I've had people write me, Oh, brother, I'll tell you, I, you need to wake up. You need to get more uh, inclusive and blah, blah, blah. It's absurd, folks. It's stupid. It is hyper-liberal. There are a lot of hyper-liberal people in the Christian community today who will try to tell you that Christianity is a faith without discipline. But I'm here to tell you today, Christianity is not a way of disciplineless living. Those who approach it as such are sadly mistaken. The military, excuse me, the very title disciple makes reference to the presence of discipline. The military requires it trains in and enforces a code of discipline. Martial arts teaches, embraces, and enforces a code of discipline. Discipline is essential to virtually every human endeavor, whether it be health, fitness, sports, the arts, if you're a singer, if you're an actor, if you play musical instruments, I guarantee you if you're going to be good at what you do, you're going to have to be disciplined. You're going to have to embrace discipline. These things require discipline. It doesn't take a great deal of compromise to destroy the whole structure of a disciplined endeavor. Just in recent months we've seen the moronic occupant of the White House pardon members of our military who were disciplined, who lost their rank or who were 
dishonorably discharged from the service because they broke protocol. They went against the discipline that is set forth by the military. And there were many in the military, many in the highest ranks, who quit, who retired, who gave up their position because Mr. Trump decided to do this. Why? Because they said, you cannot compromise military discipline at any level. The minute you do that, a little bit is too much. Yep. The minute you do that, you pollute the entire system. Now you're going to have soldiers on the battlefield who are convinced that it is not necessary to follow the rules that are set forth by the military. And Mr. Trump and even the soldier on the battlefield may not always understand the reasoning behind that particular rule or that mandate or that order. They may not understand, but the higher-ups understand. The military, they've established this order of discipline over the course of many, many decades. You do not kill innocent people. If you have any way of avoiding including innocent people in your fire, then you need to do that. Why? Because the last thing you need to do is enrage the population against you. They may not be as upset with you if you're killing the bad guy among them, but you start killing their wives, and you start killing their husbands, and you start killing their mothers and their fathers and their children and their aunts and uncles and grandparents, and all of a sudden you're creating a whole new breed and a whole new generation of terrorists. Yep. So they know what they're saying and they know why they're saying it. I got news for you today. God knows what he's saying and God knows why he's saying it. And you can argue with it. I have people all the time. I've told you many times that our church, there's a reason our church is as small as it is. There are LGBT affirming churches today that have hundreds of people in them. But I guarantee you there's not a one of those churches that preaches the message we preach. Not a one of them. They preach a hyper-liberal message. Anything goes. God's okay. You want to go out and whore up every night and sleep with everything that walks down the street and get drunk and get high and do your own thing. Listen, God understands. God gets along with you. Everything's fine. And they preach a message that is devoid of any form of discipline whatsoever. Mm -hmm. No, there are no rules. There are no guidelines. There are no mandates. There is nothing you need to do for any reason whatsoever. I've got news for you, children. If you're a child of God, if you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, oh yes, there are. Many a great career has been destroyed because of habits or vices which have intruded upon the discipline of the individual. Soldiers have been dishonorably discharged or they've had their rank stripped from them because they engaged in some activity which was contrary to military discipline and order. Many great actors or actresses have fallen from the limelight because of drunkenness or drug use which then intruded upon the disciplines which once ruled their art. Well, there are actors and actresses that at one time they did their job very professionally. They could be counted on. If there was a time set in the morning for them to be on stage or for them to be uh, on set so they could begin to record, you could count on that actor or that actress to be there. But then all of a sudden, the disciplines they once embraced, they begin to slack upon. 
Well, they used to make sure they were home and in bed by a decent hour. Now they're partying till 6 in the morning and getting drunk. And now they're unable to wake up in the morning. And even if they do, they show up on set and, and they're so messed up that even makeup and costuming can't cover them. Or they're surrounded of order and discombobbled because of drunkenness or drug use. That they're no good to the director. They're no good for filming at that moment. And their career goes down the toilet because they've lost their discipline. I'm here to tell you today, folks, as children of God, it disgusts me that there are so many in the church who are trying to tell us that discipline is not part of the Christian life. That is a lie. That is an untruth. There are many things the Word of God teaches us. I'm, I, here's where I'm going to get into some hot water. But I'm going to say it anyway. The Bible tells us to abstain from drunkenness. Now, am I saying that you cannot have a drink? Well, you can the Bible doesn't say you can't have a drink, but it says to abstain from drunkenness. Now, me personally, I've embraced for many, many decades the simple discipline that the best way to make sure you don't overdrink is not to drink at all. So if I don't drink anything, then I'm guaranteed I'm never going to wind up drunk by accident. Years ago, I was out of church. You know my story. I was out of church for a few years after coming out. And one night after classes ended for the semester and we took our final exam for the semester, some of my classmates said, why don't we go to this restaurant? It's an Italian restaurant and celebrate the end of the semester. So booby, I, like a big brainiac, I said, oh, Italian food. Now, I don't drink, but I sure do eat. And I like me some Italian food. I said, yeah, I'll go. So I went with them. And they began to order different drinks and mostly different shots. Rounds for everybody. People say, oh, you got to try this and you got to try that. Well, now for years I've been in church and I never put alcohol on my lips, you know. But this particular night I was out of church. I've come out, I'm going to hell in a handbasket anyway, God hates me, I'm an abomination, I'm abhorrent to him, so what difference does it make? So I compromised on this one discipline that I had embraced for the greater part of my life. Next thing you know, another friend is saying, let's get this shot, let's get that. Man, I mean to tell you, I never have been a beer drinker. I, you can't get me to drink that horse urine. I'm not interested in it. So I didn't have any beer, but I had a few of these and a couple of those and a bunch of these. And here I am, never been a drinker in my life. I mean to tell you, when we got done with our little celebration, my God, the whole world was just floating around like this. I mean literally. One of my friends, a girl that I was in class with, we were all older folks, you know. We weren't uh, right out of college, uh, high school, college folks. We were, had a feeling the battery might go on me today. I don't know why, I just had that feeling. But we, we were folks who had taken night classes because we were adults, you know, we'd been out of school for a while. We, mostly all of us worked jobs and what have you. And so, well, and so, there we go, testing. Is that not right? Excuse me, one minute, folks. There we go. There we go, right back on track. We were a bunch of folks who were taking, uh, my final class for the semester was an evening class, and most of the people in that class 
were young adults like myself who had been out of school for a period of time. And so we were all over 21, some of us more so over 21 than others. And this one friend of mine, she carried me home. And I'm not kidding, my whole planet was just spinning around my head while she driving home. I'm, I don't know how she stayed on the road because everything was just spinning around to me, you know. I got to the house and I remember going up to the door and I remember struggling. Oh, I mean struggling to try to get my key in the door. Now, I mean, sometimes that can be a real pip when you're sober and you can't really see the lock real well. Well, just imagine being half in the bag. And I'm sitting there trying to get the key in the lock and I'm telling you, I'm just having a hard time staying on my feet. Everything's spinning around. I'm trying to find... I finally get the key in the lock. I don't know how I did it. Got the door open, went upstairs, went to my bedroom. The last thing I remember was standing at the bottom of my bed looking at it. It's the last thing I remember. And the next morning I woke up fully dressed, shoes still on, face down, flat on the bed. See, I broke discipline. I went down a path that I normally would not follow. I did something that for many, many years and many, many decades I never had done. I allowed myself to go somewhere I had never before gone. And boy, I mean to tell you, I experienced uh, the full weight of that decision. Trying to close up today. The Word of God teaches, Oh boy, Pastor, you're going to show your Pentecostal roots now. Yes, I am, and I'm proud of it. And if anybody has a problem with it, you don't have to watch another one of our services because I'm going to keep preaching it, I'm going to keep saying it. It's the truth. It's the Word of God, whether you like it or not. The Word of God teaches modesty in dress. What? You mean modest attire is something that is part of Christian discipline? Yes, it is. Because in Christian teaching, we're to abstain from all appearance of evil. If you don't want to be called a slut, don't dress like a slut. If you don't want people thinking you've got the morals of a prostitute, then don't be running around dressing like a prostitute. Oh, now I get all my hyper-liberal friends. Well, it shouldn't matter what you wear. You can wear whatever you want to wear. It's up to you. Um, yeah, but the only problem is in Christian teaching and in Christian discipline, no man is an island. You come to church dressed like a slut, and the guy that just come into the church and never been in your church before who needs Jesus spends more of his time looking down your cleavage than he does listening to the preacher. Hello now. You see, we're not supposed to do anything that could be a stumbling block. We're not supposed to do anything that could be a distraction to another believer or to an unbeliever we're to live our lives in a manner that is blameless now there are times you're going to get people you're going to get guys who are going to lust after you it don't matter if you're wearing dresses down to your toes and wearing sleeves down to your fingertips and if you've got your collar all the way up to your neck and they're still going to lust after you you can't help that but you've done your part yeah, there are disciplines in Christianity. We're to abstain from drunkenness. The Word of God teaches we're to maintain good and constant self-control. That means we don't do drugs. Because when you do drugs, you lose self-control. You're no longer altogether in control. You may kill somebody while you're on drugs. You may have an accident while you're drunk. You may have uh, a situation arise and you're not able to respond to it the way that you should because you're impaired. And when this happens, your testimony goes down the toilet. And as a child of God, it is our responsibility to maintain a testimony and a witness 
24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So help us God. Yes, Christianity is a way of discipline. You cannot call yourself a follower of Christ. You cannot call yourself a disciple of Christ and not be disciplined. How many people can't even get up on Sunday when there's no coronavirus warning out and get to church every Sunday? We have church at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and we still have people who are so undisciplined that they can't make their way to the house of God on Sunday. The way of truth requires discipline. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, the Word of God says, Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. See, in order to destroy a vineyard, you don't have to have great big enormous animals. Them little foxes do a fine job of tearing things up and ruining things. They love those tender grapes. Amen. Those little foxes love those tender grapes. And those little foxes, man, they can get in where bigger animals can't. You might have a fence around your vineyard and it'll keep out the bears and it'll keep out the lions and it'll keep out the wild hogs, but it can't keep out the foxes. Not only that, even if you got a fence that could keep out a fox, foxes are smart. They'll figure out a way. They're going to, they're going to figure out a way to go over that fence, under that fence, through that fence. But one way or the other, they're going to figure out a way. The word of the Lord today finally says in Luke chapter 14 verses 26 through 33, my final passage today, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Remember, disciple is the root word for discipline. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I've talked about this in the past. We know that Jesus does not encourage or teach hate. When he says you've got to hate your mother, your father, he was using a form of hyperbole. He was saying that your priorities have got to be right. I have got to be your highest priority. When a man joins the military booby, his wife can be pregnant. She can have a baby while he's on the field of battle. And it is expected, listen carefully, that he's going to hate his wife, meaning that his priorities are going to be right and that even his pregnant wife, even his new baby, are going to take a back seat to his responsibilities on the battlefield. 
if that man leaves that battlefield to run off and be with his wife while she has their baby, he's going to wind up being court-martialed. He's going to lose his position. He's going to lose any benefits he might have had. He's going to be dishonorably discharged. Why? Because he broke discipline. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? I'm here to tell you as a child of God, there are disciplines. Christians embrace a life of discipline. When I was a kid, we used to dabble a little in martial arts and there were certain disciplines in the martial arts. Some of the disciplines are pretty simple. Some of them are a little more complex when it comes to the actual physical uh, motions and movements. But there are other simple disciplines like when you come out to face off with one another in a bout, you first bow and acknowledge one another. That's a discipline. That's something you do. If you come out in a match and one of the guys comes out and just stands there and he refuses to bow, you know what's going to happen? They're going to give the match to the other guy because he is not honoring the discipline of that particular form of martial art. Don't think for a moment... That Christianity is a life without discipline. Don't think for a moment that you have to compromise a great deal in order to offset your journey with the Lord. No. Sometimes a little is too much. Sometimes just a little compromise is enough to set your whole motion off, to set your entire journey off. This is why when we go to, to God in prayer, we need to pray and say, Lord, help me to be disciplined. Help me to follow the disciplines that you have set forth for me. Jesus said, why call ye me Lord? And do not the things I say. Sometimes a little is too much. Sometimes the smallest virus is able to take us down and make us ill and even potentially take our life. And today I encourage every believer, let's examine our own lives. Let's look and see, Lord, am I doing everything in my power to keep this thing simple and to stay on the straight and narrow to do things the way you would have me to do it or am I allowing myself far more room than I should and, and it doesn't have to be a whole lot all I got to do is allow myself enough room so that I set myself on the wrong path would you stand with me this afternoon amen when a little is too much